Uh, so it is my pleasure now to invite Tricia Mitchell, Manager, Regional Analysis and Relations, Environment and Climate Change Canada, and Jennifer Day, Great Lakes Regional Coordinator, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. They will share findings from the first State of Climate Change Impacts Report for the Great Lakes Basin, along with proposed priorities for science and action. This is our first of four presentations scheduled for this afternoon. And as we've been doing throughout the uh, forum, uh, we'll ask you to hold your questions. The question and answer period for this and the other three sessions will start at 325. Jennifer and Tricia. Good afternoon, everyone. As Mike just said, uh, my name is Tricia Mitchell, and I'm the Canadian co-lead for the Climate Change Impacts Annex. And I'm Jennifer Day, and I'm here from NOAA uh, on behalf of Doug Cluck, who is the actual U.S. coach lead of this annex and was not able to be here today. Um, understanding how climate change is affecting Great Lakes water quality and ecosystem health and how it might continue to affect it in the future is so important to the work that we're doing to restore and protect the Great Lakes. In our talk today, we're going to be providing an overview of how and why climate change is impacting the Great Lakes. We're also going to talk about the commitment that our two governments have made to address climate change impacts. We're going to talk about the progress that we've achieved over the last three years to meet the commitments in this annex. And lastly, we're going to talk about proposed future science needs and actions that are going to be required to guide the work over the next three years. The focus of today's presentation is our progress on the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement commitment to understand the impacts and implications of climate change on the Great Lakes water quality and to share that information with decision makers in the Great Lakes Basin. Our focus over the last three years is threefold. Uh, to build our understanding of climate change impacts on the Great Lakes, to make this information available to those who need it so that they can take action, and to use our domestic programs to address impacts and achieve the objective that we've set out for ourselves under this agreement. So scientists agree that the Earth is warming. <clears throat> the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is made up of 195 member states of the World Meteorological Organization and the United Nations, has said that warming of the climate system is unequivocal, and since the 1950s, many of the observed changes are unprecedented over decades to millennia. It's important to understand that the climate is changing and it's happening on a global scale. And you can see the extent to which scientists agree in the graph on this screen, which shows temperature data from four international science institutions since the late 1800s. While there is some variability between the four lines on the screen, what strikes me is how similar they are, how much they agree. Uh, all of them show that temperature has changed quite dramatically. And all four lines show a rapid warming in the past few decades, with the last decade being the warmest on record. This year, the World Economic Forum, in their Global Risks Report, recognized climate change, and I quote, as the most impactful risk for the years to come, ahead of weapons of mass destruction. And I'll repeat that. They recognized climate change as the most impactful risk for the years to come, ahead of weapons of mass destruction. That's pretty powerful stuff. These risks include um, increases in conflict and forced migration that can result when people's access to water is compromised. They also um, have risks that are associated with climate change related extreme weather events and natural disasters across the globe. Climate change and weather patterns also jeopardize food security among climate vulnerable countries that rely on agricultural productivity to sustain economic growth and development. So Canadians and Americans are already experiencing climate change, and it's posing significant risks to our communities, to our health and well-being, to the economy, and to the natural environment. These impacts are expected to persist and worsen, even with a concerted effort to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. 
Both of our countries recognize the importance of fighting climate change and, are bo and both are currently investing significant attention and effort to examine strategies for climate change mitigation and adaptation. The Government of Canada has committed to addressing climate change by moving towards a pan-Canadian framework for clean growth and climate change, which is a plan that will allow Canada to meet its international commitments and begin to transition our country to a more resilient, low-carbon economy. The U.S. is taking action by continuing to lead international efforts to address the threat of climate change through a climate action plan which includes unprecedented efforts to reduce carbon pollution, promote clean sources of energy, and protect communities from the impacts of climate change. This was made even more evident this past March when Canada's Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, and U.S. President Barack Obama issued a joint statement on climate, energy, and Arctic leadership. Some of the key statements from this announcement include reaffirmations from our two countries. First, reaffirming our work together to implement the Paris Agreement, a landmark agreement to combat climate change and to accelerate and intensify the actions and investments needed for a sustainable, low-carbon future. And importantly, keeping a global temperature rise this century well below 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and to pursue efforts to limit temperature increases even further to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Second, reaffirming our work together to reduce air emissions, including, for example, taking action to reduce methane emissions from oil and gas sectors by 40 to 45 percent below 2012 levels by 2025, and exploring new opportunities for additional methane reductions. Uh, reducing use and emissions of hydrofluorocarbons, and improving the fuel efficiency and reducing greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution emissions from on-road vehicles. The third is reaffirming our work together to strengthen North American energy sector and phase out fossil fuel subsidies, accelerate clean energy development, and foster sustainable energy development and economic growth. So, we know that the globe is warming, and we know that climate change is of significant concern. And what we're here to talk to you today about what is, is what this means for the Great Lakes. Jennifer and I could spend this entire session going into the details of how climate change is impacting or may impact the Great Lakes in the future. But what we'd like to do is quickly summarize with this one slide what we know about how climate change is currently impacting and is predicted to impact the Great Lakes region moving forward. <clears throat> Climate change effects are definitely evident in the Great Lakes region. Impacts observed across the basin include warming temperatures, changing precipitation patterns, decreased ice coverage, and variations to historic fluctuations of water levels. So the first one we're gonna to speak to is temperature. Over the past 100 years, annual average air temperatures have increased by 1.1 degrees Celsius, with Great Lakes water temperatures increasing faster than the surrounding air temperatures and significantly faster than the global average. This warming trend is projected to continue over the next century, with model results showing about 1.5 degrees to 7 degree increases in average air temperatures and water temperature increases predicted to closely mirror those. In the last century, surface water temperatures of the Great Lakes have increased by as much as three and a half degrees Celsius, and they're projected to increase over the next century by another 2.9 to six degrees Celsius. These increases in air and water temperature have significant implications. So for example, warm waters are more conducive to algae growth, and they can contribute to the increased occurrence of toxic and algae blooms um, that we heard about this morning. We're also seeing changes in precipitation patterns. Changes in the timing and severity of extreme storms may be one of the most significant impacts of climate change. In the next century, annual precipitation, and particularly rainfall, is expected to increase by 20% across the Great Lakes Basin. Between 1958 and 2007, the heaviest 1% of rain events increased by more than 30% in the US Great Lakes. And the amount of rain in those heaviest events is steadily increasing, making them even heavier. This results in more flooding and more runoff, which in terms of water quality impacts means that more sediment, 
more contaminants and more nutrients are flowing off the land and into the water. Changes in air temperature and surface water temperature on the Great Lakes influence the extent and duration of ice cover on the lakes. <coughs> Although ice cover varies from year to year, the overall basin-wide loss of ice cover from 1973 to 2015 is 26%. Over the past century, there has been a strong trend toward later freeze-up and earlier breakup of ice on the lakes. The ice cover period overall has decreased by one to two months. Ice dynamics affect ecosystems in many ways. For example, a longer ice-free period on the lakes can negatively impact the survival of cold water fish species like lake trout. Both natural and human in, um, activities influence variability in lake water levels and alter water levels across seasons to decades and beyond. Some of you may be familiar with the recent prolonged period of low water levels on the upper Great Lakes. And yet, despite this 14-year period of lows, there is really no obvious long-term trend toward increasing or decreasing water levels over the past century, where uh, fluctuations are the norm. But looking further into the future, fluctuations are expected to continue and while several climate change projections estimate declining water levels over time, with perhaps a greater seasonal fluctuation of lake levels becoming more common in the future, there remains considerable uncertainty in the future for water levels due to the complex hydrology of the Great Lakes. Low water levels and timing of these events can affect aquatic ecosystems in many ways, including loss of connectivity, between the lake and the altered coastal margins and the nearshore habitat structure. Shallow water areas and exposed lake bed in the nearshore zone can increase vulnerability to the expansion of invasive species and lower levels could amplify the effects of contaminants. Of course, even with long-term trends, there are likely to be significant year-to-year -year variations. Understanding how climate change is affecting processes now and may affect processes in the future is important to making informed management decisions for the Great Lakes. Because we know that the potential impacts of climate change on Great Lakes water quality and ecosystem health might be one of the greatest environmental threats facing the basin. In 2012, when, when our two governments renegotiated the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, they decided to incorporate a new annex focused on the impacts of climate change. This annex has two major focuses. First is strengthening our efforts to address the threat that climate change is presenting to water quality in the Great Lakes. And the second is taking into consideration those impacts of climate change in implementing the entire agreement. Prior to 2012, there were no commitments, let alone an entire annex dedicated to climate change. So, so this really is the beginning. This really was the beginning three years ago. We were just starting out. <clears throat> because we know that climate change impacts and exasperates other stressors to the Great Lakes, Canada and the U.S. have also committed to take climate change into consideration and work across the entire Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. Throughout the 2012 agreement, there are references to ensure that climate change impacts are considered as we work on other issues. For instance, as climate patterns and water levels change, it creates conditions that affect the distribution, spread, an effect of aquatic invasive species in the Great Lakes. A notable example is the climate-related prolonged water, low water conditions in the upper Great Lakes between 99 and 2013, which provided a favorable environment for the rapid spread of Phragmites, an invasive plant that can cause serious damage to the biodiversity of an area. So this slide is focused on our progress over the last three years. As a number of people have noted this morning, um, climate change needs to be addressed by all level levels of government, as well as by a multitude of non-governmental bodies. From decisions about stormwater infrastructure, to the design of an environment, to emergency planning for severe storm events or forest fires, there are many people who rely on climate change information to make informed decisions. Much of the work undertaken over the last three years has involved improving our understanding of the impacts of climate change in the Great Lakes and then providing that information to Great Lakes resource managers in, in order to inform their decision making. 
With the signing of the renewed Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, our initial work in 2013 was focused on establishing the necessary body of experts to deliver on a new climate change impacts annex. We've pulled together a diverse team for our Climate Change Impacts Annex subcommittee. We've got members from Canadian and U.S. federal agencies, from provincial agencies, from watershed agencies, and tribal representation. And we're always seeking new members to ensure that we have the right experts to support this work. Once we had a subcommittee, and in order to help us focus our work, we pulled together the best available peer-reviewed Great Lakes climate change science. And then we held a series of meetings and webinars in 2014 to pre present this information to other subcommittees and interested parties. And the idea was to discuss the type of climate change information that they required to do their jobs. Two key products were generated as part of this process. The first is the Great Lakes Climate Quarterly Report um, newsletters. The second was the State of Climate Change in the Great Lakes Basin Report as well as a number of other activities related to monitoring and the development or improvement of analytical tools. And we're gonna be speaking to all of those in more detail in the couple slides following. In the June of 2013, Canada and the United States issued its first ever binational Great Lakes quarterly climate summary. This newsletter, which, issue, which is issued on a quarterly basis, provides climate impacts and outlooks for the Great Lakes region in an easy to read two page document. These newsletters provide a quick and easy to understand overview of the latest season's weather and water level conditions, weather and water level related impacts, and an outlook for the upcoming quarter. All of the newsletter editions can be found online at binational.net. They are produced for use by managers and practitioners at the federal, state, provincial, regional and local scales, as well as for stakeholders and the general public. The initial response to these newsletters has been extremely positive and they continue to be well received. To give you an example of the type of information available, I'll delve a little bit into the March 2016 issue for the next few slides. One section of the newsletter focuses on Great Lakes significant events for the past three months. In this March 2016 issue of the newsletter, for instance, we can see that December was remarkably warm across the entire Great Lakes Basin with all U.S. states and the entire province of Ontario experiencing the warmest December on record. The second section of the newsletter focuses on regional climate overview for the past three months. So in this issue, you can see that the graphic on the left that winter precipitation across the basin was near to above normal, but the graphic on the right shows that much of that fell as rain and that snowfall was mostly below normal. This graphic shows that the winter season was very warm with air temperatures at between two and five degrees Celsius, which is four and nine degrees Fahrenheit for my American uh, <laughs> colleagues here in the room, um, also above normal. The newsletter also focuses on regional impacts of climate conditions. In this issue, a number of impacts were highlighted related to recreation, public health, municipal services, transportation, and shipping. For example, minimum, minimal and unstable ice resulted in poor ice fishing, which can hurt the local fishing supply stores and cause dangerous conditions as trucks and snowmobilers fell through thin ice. Several winter events also impacted transportation around the Great Lakes. For example, a high wind event in February canceled more than 160 flights at Chicago's O'Hare International Airport and also caused dangers to highway transportation because we had semi-trunks rolling over and commuter train disruptions in Chicago. And in the last section of the newsletter, it provides, a for, it provides forward looking information and focuses on the regional outlook for the next three months. Uh, the same issue noted that above normal temperatures were expected to continue across the Great Lakes from April through June 2016 and below normal precipitation for most of the U.S. Great Lakes Basin. It also had above normal temperatures and below normal precipitation forecasted so that the 2016 spring fire season was expected to begin earlier across portions of the Great Lakes Basin. So 
Looking ahead um, with that, um, in hindsight, we can look at the next issue and confirm to see if these predictions were um, good. So uh, the regional climate overview section from the spring 2016 issue uh, showed that temperatures range from near normal from 2 degrees Celsius, which is 4 degrees Fahrenheit above normal, and that spring precipitation was near below averages for all lakes basins. So it was correct. And you can see that the newsletters can be a very useful tool for forecasting outlet, um, outlooks for the coming three months. The September 2016 issue um, is now available. It's hot off the press from last week. I put several copies on the tables out in the hallway. Uh, they may all be gone, but of course you can always find them in all past issues on binational.net. So in December 2015, the State of Climate Change Science in the Great Lakes Basin Report was released, and that's also now available on binational.net. This report was developed by the Ontario Climate Consortium and Partners, and it was done in consultation with our Annex subcommittee. It provides researchers, managers, and decision makers with a thorough examination of the state of climate change science in the Great Lakes Basin to date. The report assesses available science on the observed and projected impacts of climate change across a range of 40 different themes related to climatology, hydrology, and ecology in the Great Lakes Basin. And over 250 studies were assessed um, as part of this exercise. Once the studies were gathered, the inf information was then ranked by 149 different users and producers of climate change information. And it was ranked on the basis of three criteria. The first was the agreement among the available studies. The second was the type, amount, and quality of evidence. And then any limitations of the research. And this was done in order to come up with a confidence rating of either low, medium, and or high for each theme. And it corresponds to the framework used by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So as an example, under the theme of pathogens and parasites, for trees and plants, we can say with a medium level of confidence that pathogens and parasites are likely to increase in range and prevalence as a result of climate change in the Great Lakes Basin. The report also provides a detailed review of um, vulnerabilities of the Great Lakes Basin to climate change. Um, it's based on literature, and it's organized according to physical effects, environmental chemistry and pollutants, and ecological effects and biodiversity. So as another example of vulnerability that was identified through this report um, is that uh, the number and extent of forest fires is expected to increase in the Great Lakes Basin as the climate changes. And again, that was given a rating of a medium level of confidence. The last thing the report does is identify knowledge gaps uh, for each of the impact themes. And this is really important because it's going to help inform priority setting for future research to support climate change vulnerability <coughs> assessments and action. Uh, one, one example of a knowledge gap that was identified through this process is a lack of detailed research on the vulnerability of Great Lakes wetlands to climate change. So those are the sorts of things that came out through that process. We learned a lot in the development of this report. The science is clear that the climate is changing and that these changes are impacting the Great Lakes. But there's still considerable uncertainty about how those are going to play out, how those impacts and changes are going to play out in the Great Lakes region. And um, I guess the continuing theme from the people who've been speaking all day is that we still have a long way to go and there are a lot of opportunities to continue to improve our understanding. <clears throat> All of the Great Lakes climate change studies conducted from 2010 to 2014 that were reviewed in the development of this report were also made available through a database which is housed on the Ontario Climate Consortium website. The database contains 254 studies and over 2,000 individual estimates of climate change impacts across a wide range of research themes and they can be searched through various methods. This database screenshot shows metadata after querying for Lake Erie, and you can see it provides the author, the name of the study, a summary of the method of study, and a summary of the key results of that study. The database has a user-friendly interface, it's fully searchable, and to our knowledge, it's the only comprehensive inventory of its kind for the Great Lakes Basin. Over the past three years, Canada and the U.S. have also developed and improved a variety of analytical tools to understand and predict climate change impacts in the Great Lakes. 
Because this basin is such a complicated region, long-term predictions are really difficult to make. However, many binational and domestic programs continue to make progress towards enhanced monitoring and analytical tools and in downscaling and otherwise improving regional climate scale models. Environment and Climate Change Canada also supports the development of pairing global atmospheric land ocean models and regional climate models to evaluate the impacts of climate change. This is important in the Great Lakes St. Lawrence River system because the global models do not have the resolution needed to properly, properly simulate lake specific weather phenomena such as the lake effect snow. Using regional climate models, it's possible to see how all types of precipitation may change in the future around the Great Lakes. So if you can look at this screen, you see how the resolution of the global climate models shown on the left is too coarse to properly simulate lake specific weather patterns such as lake effect snow. By using downscaling techniques, it's possible to use these models to see how all types of precipitation may change in the future around the Great Lakes. So both of these images show precipitation run under the same climate change model, but the image on the right shows the results using a downscale technique and allows us to capture regional climate events. In addition, the Ontario government continues to support the development of regional climate projections for climate impact assessments in Ontario and the Great Lakes Basin. For example, the Ontario Climate Change Data Portal was launched and it allows both technical and non-technical users, so municipalities um, and the private sector, to have easy access to the latest climate change data over the province of Ontario and Canada. These projections enhance climate research and help to inform government planning and policies in Ontario. And because climate change has so many implications, such as for agriculture, how we build our homes, how we develop our infrastructure, having, this reliable climate predict having reliable climate predictions can help resource managers to plan and adapt appropriately. Now I'm going to hand it over to Jennifer over the next couple of slides to look at a few of the interesting Canadian and U.S. projects that we're doing under, or that support work under this annex. Because the Great Lakes are the largest freshwater surface in the world, evaporation of, of these large bodies of water is a critical component of understanding the Great Lakes hydrologic cycle. The federal governments, through binational collaboration, contribute to the Great Lakes Evaporation Network, which is a network of fixed and mobile observation stations across the Great Lakes that measure evaporation, water temperatures, and related meteorological data. These fill a significant gap in the measurement, in measurement and help us to better project short and long-term variations in climate and water levels, giving us a more accurate picture of the Great Lakes water balance. Here you can see some of the fixed observation stations used across the Great Lakes Basin. This project started with observation stations in Lake Superior and Huron to estimate evaporation rates and improve Canadian and U.S. hydrometeorological models. Its success led to an expansion to include sites all over the five Great Lakes with contributions from Environment and Climate Change Canada, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, academic institutions, Limno Tech, the Great Lakes Observing System, the Great Lakes Integrated Sciences and Assessment Center, and Canada Steamship Lines who have allowed the installation of mobile system, like this one, on the bow of one of their commercial vessels. The ongoing measurements over each of the Great Lakes have greatly improved our understanding in the seasonal, interannual, and long-term variations in over-lake evaporation, highlighting the need for a sustained monitoring program to improve weather and water level forecasting and for understanding the long-term impacts of climate change. Another interesting project developed by NOAA and by the U.S. Great Lakes Restoration Initiative is the Lake Level Viewer, an online visualization and mapping tool which helps communities along the U.S. Great Lakes plan for and adapt to climate change and changing lake water levels. The viewer maps more than 3,800 miles, which is 6,100 uh, kilometers, of U.S. shoreline in the Great Lakes. It's publicly available and can be accessed online for free. The tool is interactive and allows users to display and visualize water levels associated with different lake level scenarios with a high degree of accuracy, ranging from zero to six feet above or below average lake levels. 
The water level dashboard provides an indication of the feasibility of different future water level conditions and historical context of water level variability. Users can use the elevation modes and determine lake water depths at specific locations. The viewer allows planners and decision makers with visual lake level scenarios for rise and drop information before it happens. This lake level scenario can also be incorporated into land use decisions along with economic, social, and environmental considerations to make wise investments in public infrastructure and develop resilient communities. Because rising or decreasing lake levels can affect commercial interests as well as shoreline habitats and structures, this tool has been found to be very useful. So over the last three years, hopefully we've demonstrated there's been a significant amount of work done to meet our commitments related to climate change impacts. For the next three years, we plan to continue to work with other Annex co-leads and subcommittees to make sure that climate change impacts are taken into consideration in the implementation of the entire agreement. We'd like to determine key areas where others may need climate change expertise in order to deliver on their commitments. This is a supportive role that we see ourselves playing right across the entire agreement. We also plan on conducting surveys shortly with Annex co-leads and with our own subcommittee to identify, um, if, you, if you remember we said under the climate change report there were knowledge gaps that were identified as part of that process. Uh, what we want to do is we want to work with others to see where work might already be underway that will fill some of those knowledge gaps, um, as well as to identify areas where future action is needed. And finally, given the great success of the Great Lakes Climate Summary and Outlook newsletters, we plan on continuing to use these as well, well as other mechanisms to regularly deliver useful climate and climate change information to Great Lakes resource managers and to the public in order to help people proactively take into consideration climate and climate change impacts in their decision making and work to restore and protect the Great Lakes Basin. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks, Tricia. Next up, we want to talk uh, a little bit about aquatic invasive species, and I'd like to invite to the podium Gavin Christie, Division Manager, Fisheries and Oceans Canada. <clears throat> he will also present on behalf of Todd Turner, Assistant Regional Director, Aquatic Resources Program of Region 3 U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, who has taken ill and unfortunately can't uh, join us today. So uh, with that, we'll invite Gavin to the stage and he'll discuss efforts taken by Canada and the United States to prevent the introduction and minimize risk of aquatic invasive species to the Great Lakes, including the establishment of an early detection and rapid response initiative. Gavin. There's our clicker. Yeah, that, that, that's a little practice. I'll be doing that now as we go. Um, my friend Todd wanted to pass on his uh, uh, um, uh, sadness for not being able to be here and to be talking to us today, uh, 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 to all of you, and to be sharing this time that I have to tell you about the Aquatic Invasive Species Annex. Um, Todd wanted to be sure that I told you that it was not because he uh, was worried about coming and speaking Canadian to us, because he has that process thing all down when uh, we learned that, that Todd was unable to come um, yesterday, um, uh, my friend Charlie Woolley of the service offered to, to uh, speak on his, in his behalf or his place. And then I, we shared the work that Todd and I had put together and the volume of material, and, and uh, Charlie and I agreed that he, he does not speak fast enough. Uh, so so uh, hang on, and, and we'll get this uh, process underway. Um, I'm really uh, pleased to be here and, and have a, a, a really... Uh, I'm in a good position because we have spoken a lot about aquatic invasive species during the last few days. On Monday, we spent a whole day, some of us that were here, with the Asian Carp Public Forum in which much of the message was brought forward. But I also have a real challenge, and a challenge that we've heard on a number of occasions, and that's this one. I want to tell you about some really significant successes. 
But I need to tell you also that we have much to do and that the battle is not won. We're in a position where that mixed message is something that is really tough to put together, but I hope that we can sort of convey that to you. So let's get going. Um, I'm going to tell you a bit about, about uh, step back a bit and look at, the, uh, look at history of aquatic invasive species. We're going to talk a bit about how it is we understand the risk of species and pathways. We're going to tell a little bit about how we're working to prevent future invasions about the successes that I mentioned, and uh, what's next in our priorities of science and actions. <coughs> Firstly, and most importantly, um, this work is very much the work of a, of a broad uh, 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 group of, of federal, uh, state, provincial, uh, tribal, First Nation, and uh, uh, non-government uh, organizations that have really worked together and historically and continue to in, uh, on this, this effort overall. We're fueled, as, as all programs are, by resources, and those resources come on the U.S. side through really important uh, um, um, allocations to federal agency budgets and uh, through the Great Lakes uh, Restoration Initiative. And here in Canada, uh, the investment in the Asian CARP program has been a, a core piece, and we'll be speaking more about those, those programs as we go. So first, a little bit of history. Um, we know this history well, and those of us on the Great Lakes know it well, that, that uh, aquatic invasive species have had a devastating uh, impact on, on ecosystems. We have invaders in the systems over the last century that have caused, uh, that, that caused direct uh, effect killing valued fishes, that disrupt and re-engineer uh, uh, food webs, that, dis that disrupt habitat, that reduce biodiversity, and that damage uh, value fisheries, infrastructure, and benefits official uses across the Great Lakes. Some of them we see here, of course, uh, the history of uh, through the canals of alewife, for example, uh, that in the 60s piled up on our beaches and plugged our, our, our water intakes. The sea lamprey, a most famous invader, directly killing uh, fishes with that amazing rasping tongue, and, and, uh, um, and we see some of the wounds created there. In the 1980s, we saw uh, uh, zebra mussels and quagga mussels enter the system. And those have, of course, had the amazing impacts on the system. With them came uh, uh, gobies, a fish that has greatly affected the food web, and uh, new zooplankton, which have changed the way that the food works. So we see the effects, amazing direct effects, like the uh, native mussel being smothered by zebra mussels in the, in the bottom of the, of the picture. And these same organisms that have entered the system are actually implicated in some of those changes that we've seen and heard about in the nutrients annex, for example. We saw this picture yesterday in the state of the, of the Great Lakes, this image of the number of established uh, non-native uh, species over time. And you can see we stretch back um, uh, into the 1800s. It's an amazing story of, a, of, a, of uh, uh, many species, many invaders coming through many pathways. And you can see those pathways um, uh, from live wells of boats to uh, bait release through aquaria down to shipping. And you can see that shipping was a major uh, cause of, of invasive species. And look at that rate, an increasing rate through the last 40 years. In that period, we were seeing as many as a one invader every eight months entering the system. The Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement in 2012, had a, uh, um, the drafters created a brand new annex focused on aquatic invasive species, uh, bringing a new focus on this long-standing problem and challenge. It included new commitments and new ob objectives for aquatic invasive species, and the purpose of the annex was to prevent the introduction of aquatic invasive species, to control or reduce the spread of those species, and to eradicate, where feasible, existing aquatic invasive species. There are a number of specific commitments. The first one I share with my colleagues in Annex 5, and Chris and Lauren will be speaking to you about ballast water and, and uh, modifications and, and prevention of invasives through ballast waters. We also have commitments to do risk assessments, to understand the, the risk caused by species and pathways, to establish an early detection and rapid response framework, and to take action to prevent invasion and spread through the establishment of regulation and taking actions. And of course, also to do science, to develop new tools uh, to take on those aquatic invasive species. So a lot of our work has focused on, and there's much effort, on understanding the risks of species and pathways. So let's take a look at that. To understand which species are, the, are going to cause us real trouble, we need to understand whether they can arrive, survive, reproduce in the Great Lakes, and if they get here, and will they spread, and of course, what harm will they cause? 
So we do that by understanding the organisms, their biology and their home locations, and then how, those, how that ecology and biology relates to our environment. And with that can help us understand the risks they pose. In the top map on the right, you can see that the silver carp species basically can fit almost anywhere in, in red there, which is all of North America, essentially. We bring that information together, our predictions, in, in, with figures and thinking in the graph below, where we look at the uh, probability of establishment or introduction against what are the consequences, and in that way map out and, and can see the, the, the uh, uh, make predictions, essentially, then about what the future of such organisms would have. In this case, uh, big head and silver carp, two of the Asian carp species, and you can see that in, in lakes uh, uh, Huron, Michigan, and Erie, they're extremely uh, risky to the Great Lakes. So I mentioned the big head carps, and we completed those risk assessments uh, um, a, a number of years ago. We have important efforts on other species underway. Right now, large binational uh, risk assessments underway on, on two more uh, Asian carp species, the grass carp and black carp, also threatening us uh, here in the Great Lakes. And then we've pulled across and looked across a broad range of species to identify what are the highest risk species to us all. The, uh, premiers, uh, the governors and premiers uh, 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 group has, uh, in its AIS task force, has established a, a, a least wanted 16 list of which uh, identifies those key, some of those key species. Here, for example, the uh, snakehead, uh, the killer shrimp, and water chestnut identified as, as organisms which are going to cause great important harm. Just as it's important to identify what are the target species that we need to look out for, we also need to understand um, um, which species, in fact, are going to be, you know, perhaps of less risk. And so we can map in the same way, uh, take a look at those. And um, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has established a screening tool to do just that and carried out 180 uh, screening activities. For example, the, the colorful Siamese fighting fish that we know from aquaria trade here, of course, it we found to be of low risk because it's unlikely to be able to survive here in the Great Lakes. Once we understand which species we're after, we need to understand what pathways are going to pose the most work so we can focus on those. One of the largest efforts to understand pathways is the, has been the uh, uh, Great Lakes, Mississippi, and Mississippi River Interbasin Study carried out and led by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. It's a fantastic study in its scope, uh, looking at all of the connections between the Mississippi River and the, and, uh, and the Great Lakes Basin to understand the places and intersections where aquatic invasive species could move between them. Importantly, move in both ways, because organisms in the Great Lakes, of course, would threaten the Mississippi River if that were the case. So I've identified a series of, 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 of spots, including uh, some of the intersections of the Maumee River, for example, and the, and the Ohio Basin and, and Eagle Marsh, and actions have already been taken to block off those spots. But most importantly, of course, we identify the Chicago area waterway system and its direct connection between Lake Michigan and the Mississippi River as the highest risk uh, location for the movement of those animals. And Asian carp, of course, being in the St. Mary's or in the uh, um, uh, Illinois River, uh, causes us to really look at that threat. Well, risk assessment like this can be we can dig in further and understand further about the about those work in the Chicago area waterway through the leadership of the U.S. Army Corps and, and the state of Illinois, federal partners, there's an important uh, uh, electrical dispersion barrier in place. Now we need to understand how well it's working and if there's further risk. And in the barrier, uh, we've carried out specific studies, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has led specific studies to sort of look at that issue. Using surrogate fishes have found, uh, we, found we had the observation, I should say, that there were some Asian carps of smaller size further up the river than we had expected. So they carried out careful studies using surrogate species, golden china in this case, and found that they could actually get in between the, the uh, uh, barges and get moved some miles up the, up the, fish, up the uh, canal. So there are already ideas in place to tackle that problem, but it's an important area of risk where we're drilling into that risk assessment essentially. Illegal trade and the internet trade are other pathways that we're concerned about. We've uh, carried out work with the Great Lakes Fishery Commission's Great Lakes Law Enforcement uh, 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 Committee to talk to all of the uh, law enforcement agencies around the basin to inquire with them around where they saw the greatest risk of illegal activities. And here we've mapped those risks on the top graph as a relative risk scale. And you can see that, that uh, uh, pond culture and, and movement of fishes in ponds and live bait are highest ranked risks in this case. And there are a number of other ones of, of issues. We also um, uh, see important work by the Great Lakes Commission 
to help us understand the uh, impacts of internet trade with a new tool they've developed called the Great Lakes Detector of Invasive Aquatics and Trade. This new tool uses a web, crawl a web crawler. <laughs> now, if I was as young as Cam Davis, I'd probably know what that is. I have no idea. But it sounds very, very cool. And I do know <laughs> that it, what it has done is really set up a tool that's available to, to management and others to, to help them uh, understand and explore uh, organisms moving uh, through the internet, where, you, of course, you can buy anything that you want. Um, on the Canadian side, we carried out a large-scale uh, investigation of the risks of, of shipping, including a full binational ex exploration of, of the Great Lakes. And that, uh, that work, uh, uh, published in 2014, identified the risks of, uh, to the Great Lakes. It identified the successes of the current ballast water exchange uh, work and effort. It identified the need for treatment plus that, that exchange to reduce risk. And it also identified the risk of, of movement of, a, of aquatic invasive species in the ballast water of, of Great Lakes uh, freighters moving just within the basin. We've also carried out a national risk assessment on the Canadian side, which uses, looks at the entirety of the Great Lakes on recreational boating and uh, the movement of, and the potential movement of, of organisms by recreational boating. In the, oops, in the, uh, um, Here's the uh, picture, image of the, of the ports that were examined in the, in, the, in the shipping assessment. And the recreational boating assessment down in the bottom right-hand side, in the small figures, you can see the kind of, of modeling that was involved there, where, where, where we set up a model where you could actually see if, a, if for example, in this case, a, an organism were to be, occur in Ludington, how quickly it would move uh, just by movement of, of, of recreational boats around the basin. That effort and, um, and others have guided the, uh, the U.S. federal government to work with, with boating manufacturers on developing aquatic invasive species safe boats where, where the, uh, uh, say, the uh, uh, water handling systems in those would be less, less prone to invasive species. So, of course, then our next focus and the major focus is the prevention of spread, um, where prevention is key, of course. So our first order there, as directed, is to set up that second line of defense to determine to set up uh, early detection and rapid response frameworks to be able to, to respond, to find and respond to new invaders. We've made really significant uh, uh, progress in this regard. Identifying the key species in Canada, Asian carps, in, um, in the United States, Asian carps and, and other uh, fishes and benthic organisms. We identified the key locations of highest risk through our risk assessments uh, for um, um, the uh, species to occur, or that where they might occur or enter, and then where we might find them based on, the, on, on those risk assessments. And here you can see in the map the survey sites in the United States and in Canada carried out under these two programs. So we tackled the program, with, uh, the, the study using traditional gears in this case, netting gears to capture, capture those fishes, focused on those fishes, Asian carps, it turned out, are hard to catch. And so we have to use a series of, of techniques and a whole bunch of those, of, of those techniques in combination to find them. Here you can see netting being carried out, electrofishing at the top where you use electricity sample, and then larval fish nets that catch the fish when they're, when they're young in the system. In Lake Superior, our efforts are enhanced by, by a, a whole lake effort there where the province of Ontario and state uh, 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 groups are also looking at, at uh, identifying invasive species there. We've literally carried out thousands and thousands of samples uh, here in this, in this process. We also use new tools to help in, uh, in, enhance those techniques. Tools that have really only come into being in the last, in the last 10 and 5 years are pulled into full, in, into full process using environmental DNA to look in the water for fragments of DNA shed by organisms to see if we can find them. In this case, Asian carp species. Here you can see the sample sites for, for eDNA work by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in, in blue and then, and then by the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry in green there. We can cover a lot of ground here, um, uh, sampling water uh, in this way. But it's a tricky deal where we have to uh, be sure that, that those, those samples are sterile and not contaminated and that, and that they, they can help us. It's a new tool that's helping us uh, uh, identify the spots to look and in conjunction with our other traditional techniques gives us the, the, the approach that we can use to, to, to say that we're really doing a good job looking for that needle in the haystack that would be in a new invasive species. Um, we have set up along with, this, with these assessments important information sharing uh, 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 regimes and protocols that, that are connecting the, the, the pieces of the story together. 
We need to be able to respond if we find new organisms, and those response plans have been developed domestically in each of the states. Uh, uh, new response plans were put together in, in Canada, on, uh, um, uh, the province of Ontario and Fisheries and Oceans Canada put together a response plan for Asian carps. All are based on incident command, the, the emergency uh, uh, system that we would put in place to respond to such an emergency. The uh, uh, Governors and Premiers Mutual Aid agree uh, uh, Committee have put together a, a, an important mutual aid agreement where the states and provinces uh, have joined efforts. We've taken efforts to, to try these things out through either tabletop exercise, that is sitting in a meeting room and trying out the exercise overall, or in the field, um, uh, noted in the middle, a large scale field program to look for grass carps in, in Western Lake Erie uh, involving all federal, state, and, and uh, provincial agencies. And in Illinois, an important effort around, around um, looking for uh, rough and grass carp. In Canada, in our detection efforts and through other efforts, we found a number of grass carp We've been able to put our full in, uh, um, response plans into place, working with the province to respond to those findings, and uh, have been successful in doing so. So we've learned how well our systems work uh, in responding, and in those cases, we've been able to capture uh, animals extensively and to, and to, as we believe, effectively remove them. Key to our actions and responses is the, uh, or the uh, is establishing new legislation and regulation for the basis for action. And in, uh, those new regulations have been, are, are central to those actions. In Canada, we have brand new national uh, AIS regulations under the Fisheries Act. In the United States, um, um, which came into place last April, in the United States, the Fish and Wildlife Service has new Lacey Act uh, listings for, of 11 species that are coming into place in, in, in the next uh, just few weeks. In Ontario, brand new invasive species legislation is, is coming into force in November. In Michigan, new listings under the Natural Resources and Environmental Protection Act are coming into play. And New York has also amended its regulations. Those regulations provide the basis for, for, for action uh, to deliver control and, and to prevent introductions. I mentioned that, that all our work is, has been working with others and we've been building on successful collaborations like the Great Lakes Fishery Commission's collaboration, which has been delivering sea lamprey control for many years. Central to our actions have been the work of the Great Lakes Commission and the Aquatic Nuisance Species uh, 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 Group, uh, which, has been, uh, which we've been working on closely. The Conference of Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Governors and Premiers AIS Task Force has been also of, of critical uh, of, um, success in, in, in delivering the successes we mentioned. The Asian Carp Regional Coordinating Committee is central to uh, responding to Asian carp overall. We're building and working with new collaboratives, including the Phragmites Collaborative, um, um, which, is a, which we mentioned earlier, which has a, a, been a source of best practices overall, and the Evasive Muscle Collaborative. And we're looking at new opportunities, working under the Joint Strategic Plan. There's been important new science around uh, new de detection um, uh, techniques using uh, real-time eDNA using sound um, and other um, methods to block uh, organisms looking for ways to deliver piscicides or, or, or compounds that could affect organisms directly, like micro-capitalization of piscicides to try to treat and, and control Asian carps. And we've been doing work in mesocosms, for example, the one year sent to the Canada Center for Inland Waters, looking at, at uh, uh, containment and disruption techniques. We've responded and connected with, with uh, climate change um, and, and tried to understand the effects on AIS. The Fish and Wildlife Service has established a new tool to do predictions there. And in this example, for example, the golden mussel, one of the least wanted species, uh, poses threats to the Great Lakes. And we can look at what would be the predictions of, of climate. And, and uh, in this case, we see an uh, increase in the overlap of, of uh, potential viable environments with the Great Lakes. Outreach and engagement of the public is central to the, to the efforts of the, of the annex. And, and there, as well, we've built on, on the great work of the Great Lakes Panel for Aquatic Nuisance Species. Its Information Education Committee has been doing a great job of exchanging the, the, that information. We're building on the, on the back of aquatic, Stop the Aquatic Hitchhikers efforts, other sea grant efforts like Habitatitude. In Ontario, the, um, the Invasive Species Awareness Program is a really critical uh, effort with leading to citizen science to help us uh, find and detect invasive species. And then we have a large scale uh, outreach program through the Invasive Species Center and an OFAH uh, to help us uh, educate people about invasive Asian carps. So let's look at that success. 
I showed this, this image earlier. We were on a trajectory towards increasing numbers of invasive species. But when we look at it today, um, we see in the last decade, there has not been a, a newly established invasive species in the Great Lakes. An amazing success. That success uh, bears uh, greatly on the, on the work of the Binational Ballast Water Exchange Regulation, the 100% monitoring program that Chris and Lauren will speak about in a few minutes. And of course, also on those efforts to protect the Great Lakes from Asian carps. So it's really an important story. But it doesn't end there, because we do still see some uh, invasive, like, like um, um, uh, water lettuce, mitten crabs, and others. So what's next for us? We have uh, a number of priorities, which include uh, moving on all the priorities and actions of the, of the group, including advancing our science uh, for tools for, for containment and eradication, design and passage around, around barriers, improving our tools for detection, we're looking at refining our, our, our early detection and rapid response initiative and to developing a clearinghouse for aquatic invasive species risk assessment so we can share that understanding. So th thank you very much. I, I hope that I've conveyed the message that we've made real progress and that we have much more to do. So thank you.